Good afternoon. It was here at Bletchley Park where codebreakers, including the British genius Alan Turing, cracked the Enigma cipher, and where we used the world's first electronic computer. Breakthroughs which changed possibilities for humanity. So there could be nowhere more fitting for the world to come together to seize the opportunities of the greatest breakthrough of our own time, while giving people the peace of mind that we will keep them safe. I truly believe there is nothing in our foreseeable future that will be more transformative for our economies, our societies and all our lives than the development of technologies like artificial intelligence. But as with every wave of new technology, it also brings new fears and dangers. So no matter how difficult it may be, it is the right and responsible long-term decision for leaders to address them. That is why I called this summit, and I want to pay tribute to everyone who has joined us and the spirit in which they have done so. For the first time ever, we have brought together CEOs of world-leading AI companies with countries most advanced in using it and representatives from across academia and civil society. And while this was only the beginning of the conversation, I believe the achievements of this summit will tip the balance in favour of humanity. Because they show that we have both the political will and the capability to control this technology and secure its benefits for the long term. And we've achieved this in four specific ways. Until this week, the world did not even have a shared understanding of the risks. So our first step was to have open and inclusive conversation to seek that shared understanding. We analysed the latest available evidence on everything from social harms like bias and misinformation to the risk of misuse by bad actors through to the most extreme risks of even losing control of AI completely. And yesterday, we agreed and published the first ever international statement about the nature of all those risks. It was signed by every single nation represented at this summit, covering all continents across the globe, and including the United States and China. Some said we shouldn't even invite China. Others said that we could never get an agreement with them. Both were wrong. A serious strategy for AI safety has to begin with engaging all the world's leading AI powers, and all of them have signed the Bletchley Park communique. Second, we must ensure that our shared understanding keeps pace with the rapid deployment and development of AI. That's why last week I proposed a truly expert global panel to publish a State of AI Science report. Today at this summit, the whole international community has agreed. This idea is inspired by the way the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was set up to reach international science consensus. With the support of the UN Secretary General, every country has committed to nominate experts. And I'm delighted to announce that Turing Prize winner and godfather of AI, Joshua Bengio, has agreed to chair the production of the inaugural report. Third, until now, the only people testing the safety of new AI models have been the very companies developing it. That must change. So building on the G7 Hiroshima process and the global partnership on AI, like-minded governments and AI companies have today reached a landmark agreement. We will work together on testing the safety of new AI models before they are released. This partnership is based around a series of principles which set out the responsibilities we share. And it's made possible by the decision I have taken, along with Vice President Kamala Harris, for the British and American governments to establish world-leading AI safety institutes with the public sector capability to test the most advanced frontier models. In that spirit, I very much welcome the agreement of the companies here today to deepen the privileged access that the UK has to their models. Drawing on the expertise of some of the most respected and knowledgeable AI experts in the world, our Safety Institute will work to build our evaluations process in time to assess the next generation of models before they are deployed next year. Finally, Fulfilling the vision we have set to keep AI safe is not the work of any single summit. The UK is proud to have brought the world together and hosted the first summit, but it requires an ongoing international process to stay ahead of the curve on the science and to see through all the collaboration that we have begun today. So we have agreed that Bletchley Park should be the first 
of a series of international safety summits, with both Korea and France agreeing to host further summits next year. The late Stephen Hawking once said, AI is likely to be the best or worst thing to happen to humanity. If we can sustain the collaboration that we have fostered over these last two days, I profoundly believe that we can make it the best. Because safely harnessing this technology could eclipse anything we have ever known. And if in time history proves that today we began to seize that prize, then we will have written a new chapter worthy of its place in the story of Bletchley Park, and more importantly, bequeathed an extraordinary legacy of hope and opportunity for our children and generations to come. Thank you. We'll just take some questions from the media. Can I start with Sky? Thank you very much indeed uh, for taking my question. Um, can you tell me, you say that you've deepened uh, the access that you're going to get for testing and safety. Can you give us an example, a concrete example of how you're going to get better or deeper access to some of these models to reassure people that they will be safer following these negotiations? And if I may, looking forward to your meeting with Elon Musk this evening, um, what is uh, most interesting to you out of that meeting? His views on killer robots or whether he might be prepared to uh, build a Tesla battery factory here in the UK, for example? Great. So when it comes to AI safety testing, what I want people to be reassured by is that we in the United Kingdom are actually ahead of, I think, any other country in developing the capabilities and tools that we need to keep people safe. We've announced the creation of the AI Safety Institute. It's backed by a significant amount of funding. It builds on the work of the Foundation Model Task Force that we set up a while ago. Uh, and not only is it funded, it's also attracting the best and the brightest scientists and researchers from around the world to come and work there. Uh, because in order to regulate this technology, in order to make sure that it is safe, we have to have the capability to understand what these models are capable of to do that safety testing and evaluation. And I think the critical thing that we've agreed today, uh, which as I said, a truly landmark agreement, is that we will be able to do that in advance of these models being released. Now, that is a new step that was necessary. People have called for it. And when I was speaking to many of you last week, indeed it was raised then. Uh, I think it may well have been uh, raised by you, uh, Tom, but I'm pleased to say we've delivered on that. Uh, you were right to ask it because in order to make sure that people can be kept safe, we need to be able to get in there in advance to do the testing. And that's what the Safety Institute will do. Now there's a rate, uh, without, we haven't got time to go into all the different things that it will do now, but in, in broad sense is, that our job in government is to have the expertise to go and test things before our citizens are exposed to them to make sure that they're safe. That's what we will now be able to do, and we're developing the capability and the expertise to do that. There's a range of different uh, methodolog methodologies that are used to deliver that, but fundamentally, people should be reassured. Not only do we have the, the tools and the capabilities being developed here at a, at a rate faster than any other country, we now have the agreement we need to go and do the testing before the models are released to the public. And that is something that I think the summit will, uh, will look back and say is a terrific achievement, a landmark achievement of this summit. Uh, next, I'll go to the Telegraph. Uh, thank you, Prime Minister. I was actually going to ask about uh, Elon Musk as well, so I'll ask something uh, similar. First of all, um, what are you planning to raise with him tonight? But also, is your chat not being live-streamed because you're concerned about what he might say? Uh, I think, I, you know, Elon Musk is someone who has for a long time spoken about AI. He's uh, an investor and entrepreneur, has developed AI companies, and as one of the leading actors in AI, it's important that he was engaged in this summit, and I'm delighted that he was uh, attending and participating yesterday. And actually, it was probably around a decade ago that he first started talking about some of the risks that AI could pose and the importance of governments and others doing what is necessary to mitigate against those. And I think actually rather than focus on any one personality, I think the achievement of this summit, and I pay tribute to uh, Michelle for all our hard work over the past few months to, to bring this all together, is you know, for us to have assembled over 100 of the leading AI nations leading companies developing the technology and then experts 
from industry, academia and civil society together in one place for the first time to have this conversation. I think that is, is truly an extraordinary achievement. It has not happened before anywhere. And that's the United Kingdom demonstrating global leadership to make that happen. It's not about any one person, it's about the collection that we have brought together. And as you can see in my remarks, yeah, not only has it been a very good and thoughtful conversation, it has led to some very concrete outcomes that will ensure that we all can enjoy the benefits of AI, uh, which are extraordinary in how it's going to change our lives in healthcare and education, our economy, uh, but do so in a way that is safe. Uh, and this summit and the outcomes from it will ensure that that is the direction that we are now on, and, and that is because of the leadership that the United Kingdom has shown and played, and that has been recognised by everyone who was at the summit, has paid tribute to the UK for convening this and bringing people together in the way that we have done. Uh, and as I said, you can see the success in the fact that not just South Korea but France are now hosting the next two summits. So I think we should take that as a, uh, another mark of uh, success for us, that others are wanting to do the same thing and continue this conversation. Uh, next, we go to the BBC. Thank you, Prime Minister. Chris Mason, BBC News. Your focus at the summit here has been on safety issues relating to AI. But do leaders need to be more candid about the consequences of AI revolutionising workplaces, bluntly, potentially, putting lots of people out of work? Yeah, I know this is an anxiety that people have, and I think there's a, a couple of different ways that we should think about it. The first is I, I we should look at AI much more as a co-pilot. Uh, than something that necessarily is going to replace someone's job. You know, AI is a tool that can help almost everybody do their jobs better, faster, quicker. And that's how we're already seeing it being deployed. So if you're taking government, for example, uh, DWP, a caseworker at the moment putting together paperwork for a benefits tribunal, I think maybe can do about 11 cases over the course of a week. Um, you know, AI can do the same amount of work with that same person, it can help that same person do the same amount of work in uh, an hour. And that's extraordinary because it means that, that that person can then get through the backlogs much faster, we can get through people's cases much quicker, and it's a, a good example of how we can bring the benefits of AI to lots of people. But we should think of it much more like that, like, like a co-pilot to someone doing their job. Um, and that's, that's how I think about it. But technology always has the potential to change labour markets and patterns of employment. It's hard to predict how that will evolve. What we do know is that AI already is responsible for 50,000 jobs across the UK. You know, we should be proud that we are a leading AI nation. You know, we've got world leading research talent here, companies developing technology that's already creating jobs in every part of our country. And as it pertains to the future, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm of the view that technology like AI, which enhances productivity, you know, over time is beneficial for an economy. It makes things cheaper, it makes the economy more productive. Uh, but that does mean jobs can change. Uh, an MIT study that I mentioned recently showed that something like 60% of the jobs at the time that it did the study didn't exist 40 or 50 years before, to give you a sense of the change. So my job, government's job, is to make sure that we have a world-class education system. You know, that is my answer in a nutshell. That's why I don't want people to be worried, because we are building a world-class education system not just in our schools where standards are going up, not just in the reforms for 16 to 18 year olds that I announced recently with more maths and English, uh, broader curriculum, higher quality technical education brought together, uh, but with lifelong learning, the ability to train and retrain backed by government support at any stage in your life. You know, that is what a world-class education system looks like. And it's because we're delivering that, I'm confident that we as a society will just reap the benefits of AI economically and people will always be able to have the opportunities to flourish because we'll be supporting them to get the skills that they need. And so I know it's an anxiety that people have, but you should be reassured because we're developing the education and skill system that we need to ensure everyone can flourish over the years and decades to come. Uh, next, can I go to ITV? Prime Minister, uh, Robert Best of ITV. Um, Prime Minister, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you're talking about voluntary arrangements with big tech rather than a formal licensing regime. But isn't the lesson of the Wild West of social media that there'll be tremendous harm unless we legislate? Yeah, I think, uh, Robert, the, I think the lesson is that we need to move quickly 
and that's what we're doing and that's why I, I started focusing on this some months ago it's why we've convened this summit which again is a comment that everyone has made that now is the right time to be doing this the technology is developing at such a pace that governments have to make sure that we can keep up now you know before you start mandating things and, and legislating for things, I think, A, by the way, that takes time and we need to move faster and we are. Uh, but secondly, you need to know exactly what you're legislating for. And that's why our Safety Institute is so important. With a technology that is developing in the way that it is, where the people who are developing it themselves are constantly surprised by what it can do, it's important that that regulation is empirically based, that it's based on scientific evidence. And, and that's why we need to do the work first. So the Safety Institute, which is up and running, needs to do the evaluations and the research and the testing so we understand what we're dealing with, I think, before we can then spell out the formal regulation that's required. But look, I'm, I'm highly confident that we uh, have got the agreement that we need from the leading frontier AI companies, all of whom are represented at this summit, to get the access that we need to do the testing that is required, and we will be able to work in partnership with other AI safety institutes. The Vice President was here and talking about this yesterday, as was the US Commerce Secretary. It's a very welcome development that countries like the US are also developing a safety institute, and they've been very clear they expect to work closely with us, and that was what we wanted to achieve at this summit. It wasn't just about us doing this. One of our objectives was for other countries to invest in safety research and to approach it in a collaborative way where all these institutes around the world are working together to share research analysis and information because that way we will build up a much better picture of exactly what we need to, to manage against. And so far we've got the cooperation that we need. You know, of course, I think everyone would acknowledge you know, ultimately you know, binding requirements will likely be necessary, but it's important that we do those in the right way, and that needs to be based, as I said, on empirical evidence that we'll get from our testing in the first place. Uh, next, Channel 4. Hi, Prime Minister, it's Heli Abrahim from Channel 4 News. Uh, Professor Benjo is very keen that the onus is on companies to prove that their AI applications are safe. Um, do, you, do you back that call? Should the onus be on the companies and should they be asked to have a certain amount of budget dedicated to making sure that those AI applications are safe? The, the point I would make is that what we can't do is expect companies to mark their own homework. All right. it, it, you know, I don't think people would expect that in other walks of life. It's incumbent on governments to keep their citizens safe and protected, and that's the approach we take to everything else. That's the approach we'll take here. That's why we've invested significantly in our AI Safety Institute. You know, it's, it's our job to independently, externally evaluate, monitor, and test these models to make sure that they are safe. Now, you know, do I think companies have a, a general you know, moral and uh, responsibility to ensure that the development of their technology is happening in a safe and secure way. Yes. Is, is that what they also believe? Yes. That's what I've all just sat in a room with them. They've all said exactly the same thing. But I think they would also agree that governments do have to play that role. And indeed, they've all signed up to a set of declarations which accepts that, uh, that there should be external validation, testing, monitoring of their models. Bef you know, during training, before deployment, and afterwards. That's the agreement that we've reached today, which is why it's so important. Um, but I don't think we can outsource that job. I do think fundamentally, you know, governments or a network of governments working collaboratively do need to provide their citizens with the independent assurance uh, that the models are safe. But also, fundamentally, it's only governments that can test for national security risks. We, you know, it, it, ultimately, that is the responsibility and knowledge of a sovereign government, and with the involvement of our intelligence agencies, as they have been with all our AI work thus far, you know, that is the job of governments. Uh, no one else can do that on, be on behalf of them. So that's why, you know, as I said, we've taken a, a leading stance in developing the capabilities through the AI Safety Institute, and you know, I'm excited that that offer is going to be made available to the world. Again, that is British leadership. Those are, those are our values. That's how we do things. Not only are we going to provide the research and evaluation, we've been very clear that we will share that work collaboratively uh, with other governments around the world because we view this as a shared challenge. AI doesn't respect borders, and we're only going to solve this problem if we work together. And we, we hope our institute can be a leading part of how we do it, and we hope, and I already am hearing from other countries, how appreciative 
of that offer they are, and they're all keen uh, to partner with us in the, in the coming months. Uh, next, could I go to the I? Uh, thank you, Prime Minister Hugo Jai from the I. Um, you told us last week that we shouldn't be losing sleep over the existential risks of AI. Uh, despite the breakthroughs of this summit, what you don't have, what you haven't agreed, is an international regulatory framework for uh, the control of AI. When should we start losing sleep if that's not developed? Well, I think what people can see coming out of this summit that there's been more practical, concerted action to improve AI safety than at any point previous to today. And that's being done on the most international basis that we've ever seen. The first ever bringing together, as I said, of leading AI nations civil society, academic experts, and the developers of the technology themselves in the same place, agreeing to the same set of principles and crucially to the independent external evaluation of models before they are deployed. And that is a significant achievement which will enhance safety. And, and you know, in turn, when I said people don't need to lose sleep on it today, you know, that's because there is a genuine debate about these risks. Now, you know, some believe that they will manifest itself, and we're talking about the most extreme risks where others have, others have said that the risk from AI could be on a similar par to those like nuclear war or pandemics. Others disagree with that. People from the industry don't think that that is possible uh, and won't happen. You know, my view is, even if there is a small possibility that that happens, it, the right and responsible thing for governments to do is to act. And that is exactly what we have done. And not only have we acted, we have led that conversation uh, so that we can reassure people here at home that we're taking the steps that are necessary to mitigate, mitigate against that risk, however remote or in the future it is. Uh, and I want to do that, and this is why we should make sure we focus properly as well, I want to be able to do that so that we can then actually spend a lot of our time, energy, focusing on all the incredible things that AI is going to do for us and is already doing for us. As I said, revolutionising healthcare, drug discovery, diagnosis, and education. We announced an initiative just this week to provide thousands of teachers with access to AI for lesson planning and quizzes, which they've been piloting for a while already with spectacular results in terms of performance and reduction on their workload. You know, the prospect of every child having a personalised AI tutor, which we know will make an enormous difference to their learning outcomes, how it's going to shape every single business and improve productivity, as we've discussed. You know, those are all the incredible things that AI can do that actually the UK is very well placed to lead out as well uh, because of our, uh, our incredible entrepreneurs and our environment for that. Um, but I want us to be able to do that in the knowledge that the AI that we are using is safe. And that's why these two things go together. And now that we can put in place what the guardrails that are necessary to keep us safe, we can really focus on in, in getting all the benefits of AI because it really can be transformational. Uh, and then lastly, if I could turn to Channel 5. Thank you, Prime Minister. Andrew Bell, Five News. Um, China was invited here, but they weren't invited to the session that you chaired today. You claim you don't trust them fully. Why would you trust them to stick to any rules on AI in the future? Yeah, thanks. And I think that I think it's a very glass, kind of half-empty way to look at it, right? Lots of people said we. We shouldn't invite China at all. Then lots of people said, well, even if you invite them, they won't come. Then everyone said, if they come, then they won't agree. Well, not only did we invite them, they did come, and they signed up to the same set of principles that we, the Americans, the Europeans, and dozens of other countries did. Now, that hasn't happened in a long time. And again, I think it, it speaks to our ability in the UK to convene people, to bring them together, and actually really make tangible progress on solving some of the world's big problems. Now, that, it wasn't an easy decision, right? It wasn't an easy decision for you to invite China, and indeed, lots of people criticized me for it, but I think it was the right long-term decision, because any serious conversation about AI safety has to engage the leading AI nations. Now, look, I can't predict the future and exactly how this is all going to pan out, but it would have been a mistake not to try 
and we you know we achieved the outcome that we wanted which was for them to be here to be engaged as they were with uh, Michelle and others yesterday and for them to have signed up to the Bletchley Park communique alongside as I said the EU the US and uh, lots of others that is a significant achievement of UK engagement UK diplomacy UK leadership uh, and it's very much in keeping with our foreign policy strategy which is uh, the China I've talked about this before it's to protect align and engage protect ourselves against the risks that we see and we're doing that for example our national security and investment act allows us to block investment into sensitive sectors of our economy we've used it for example in semiconductors align making sure our approach is aligned with our allies and again it is and they have been very supportive of us uh, having china here and believe it's the right thing to do and it's similar to how they approach these questions because you need to uh, engage, and that's the last question. Um, because we're protecting ourselves on the things that matter, on the areas where you require global cooperation, climate change, pandemics, financial stability, AI, uh, it's worth trying to engage with China because they are an indisputable uh, leading AI nation, and it, and it would be odd not to try. Um, but I'm pleased that we managed to achieve that. So uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for your time. Also, just wanted to say,